if you've watched my favorite things in wrestling 2000 video and if you haven't please do it's my best work you'll know that i was smitten by the villano de cero versus atlantis program from the start of that year so smitten in fact that i said multiple times in that video that i wanted to watch more lucha that wasn't an empty statement lucha is a massive blind spot in my fandom and it always has been and i want to fix that because if any lucha is as good as Bellano vs Atlantis, I kind of need to because that match is perfect and I want more perfect wrestling in my life. So I'm starting this series called Learning Lucha because I'm very clever and good at naming things. I'm going to track down some lucha and give my thoughts, whether it's something from the past or present, whether it's a show, a feud or just a match. I'm going to share my journey as I discover what the scene has to offer as I go on this journey to discover what I've been missing for my whole fandom. <laughs> Like a lot of wrestling fans, my history with Lucha isn't exactly extensive and most of it lies outside of Mexico. People like Rey Mysterio in the Fed or Dragon Lee in New Japan or the Lucha Bros in All Elite Wrestling and Lucha Underground just in general. <laughs> and because of this, I've noticed that a lot of what I've heard about Lucha Libre has come from people who don't watch it. Well, wrestling fans having opinions on things they don't watch, that's never happened ever. There's this not so uncommon perception that Lucha is just big high spots and flips and fast pacing that simply does not ring true if you've watched even a little bit of Lucha. While these traits can be fairly common in Lucha, although being honest it's a common style all over the world, they're not exactly traits that I'd say has defined my limited viewing of Lucha so far. I think putting Lucha under that umbrella Rings like people basing their opinions on Japanese wrestling on GIFs of Kenta Kabashi throwing chops or American wrestling based on the dumbest clips you can see from Monday Night Raw. Like I said in my 2000 video, I think a lot of that perception can be traced back to the WCW Cruiserweights. The style of these Cruiserweights were often very fast paced, almost spotty because they'd only have a brief window to get themselves over. The division rewarded a lot of the traits that I described earlier as the lucha stereotype. And when a lot of your Mexican signees reside in that division, it will leave an impact on people who don't watch lucha of, okay, that must be what lucha is. This kind of gets reinforced as time goes on with a lot of Mexican talent featured on American TV being in short, spotty TV matches. For example of this, look at how Rey Mysterio, the Lucha House Party, the Lucha Dragons or Mexico got booked in their time in the Fed. Their lucha-ness was often the core of their gimmicks. In two of those examples, it's literally in the fucking name. <laughs> And if a Mexican talent didn't wrestle that style, their lucha background wouldn't be brought up 9 times out of 10. For example, Alberto Del Rio wasn't a lucha star, he was just a rich man from Mexico and also a massive cunt. This isn't just a WWE thing, I must stress AW's main lucha rep is the lucha bros who exemplify this style, especially Phoenix. Super indies like PWG and at the time Progress would book luchadors like the Lucha Bros, Bandido, Flamita or Ray Horace who would deliver that kind of spectacle. This would also bleed over into Lucha Underground whose runtime would incentivize these big spotty firework shows. But it wasn't all Lucha Underground was but that's what people kind of remember it for. And the few gifts I see shared from modern lucha tends to be high spots like Aerostar jumping from the rafters or basically anything El Hijo del Vikingo does in AAA. <laughs> Again, that kind of stuff isn't uncommon in lucha and there are exceptions to the American TV representation I mentioned like Roosh in Ring of Honor or Andrade in his time in WWE and AEW. But for the longest time, lucha was sold to me as being only that and that's clearly not true. Which again is why I was inspired to start a series like this. Because lucha can be anything from those spotty affairs that I just mentioned to heated and bloody brawls to games of chess where one tiny slip up can cost someone a match. <laughs> Joseph Montecilio made a fantastic point in his video reviewing Ariel vs. Villano de Cero Jr. about how Lucha isn't really for us 
and by us, I mean nerds who watch or, heaven forbid, create wrestling content. Who do that? What a colossal waste of your time and resources. I, I wouldn't, I would never. It's not a scene that breaks into even my niche part of wrestling Twitter all that often. As such, I found it not the most accessible thing. Breaking into Lucha, which has one of the richest legacies in all of wrestling, is daunting from the outside. You know, it's like when you get into comic books, just there's all this lore and you think you need to know all of it before just getting stuck in. And there's less resources to help you with all of that. Say you're a wrestling fan who has exclusively watched American wrestling, but seeing Japanese wrestlers in American promotions has piqued your interest and you want to jump into that scene. There are scores of video essays, podcasts, blogs, and articles saying where to start and what's good. And sites like Cage Match tend to give you a great idea of what's worth watching from their latest shows. But say you're getting into Lucha, resources for Lucha do exist in some forms. There's not a ton of Lucha video essays that I've come across. Resources exist, but there's nothing as big as, say, the Super J cast, or even Joseph Montecilia with his King's Road series, or Forest Over back when he was covering New Japan. And going back to the cage match example, CMLL is the oldest wrestling promotion in the world, established in 1933. That was pre-World War II, that's ancient history. <laughs> on cage match, it has 565 matches on the site's match guide, which basically catalogues recommended matches from any given promotion. This is a shockingly small amount when you compare it to basically any other comparatively sized American or Japanese promotion. For example, NOAA was founded in 2000, which, fun fact, is a long time after 1933, and it has over 2,000 matches on its match guide. Stardom was established in 2011, and it has over 1,500. Hell, AEW was founded in 2019, three years ago, and it has over 1,500 matches on there. I 100% understand why that's the case, but it does mean getting into modern lucha especially can be difficult. It just doesn't get the coverage. You do, generally speaking, have to go more out your way to find this information than you do with most other scenes in wrestling, which can turn a lot of people away. And it's something I've been struggling with when conceptualizing this series. <laughs> So the first match I've chosen to cover on this series happened in 1983 between MS1 and Sangre Chicana. It takes place on the EMLL 50th anniversary show. Impresa Mexicana de la Lucha Libre, or as it's now known, CMLL, is the oldest wrestling company in the world, as I mentioned earlier. I chose this match for a couple reasons. First of all, it received some of the highest praise of any match that got recommended to me for this series. It's generally agreed upon to be one of the best Lucha matches of all time. But also, among the matches I've been recommended so far, it's the oldest, which will help me in a couple ways. Well, first of all, the footage quality is... Well, it's a VHS rip of a match from 1983. I'm fully aware going into this series that a lot of Lucha hasn't been preserved in the best quality. So this will help serve as a good test. Can I get over footage quality? The answer is yes, by the way. Spoilers, yes, the match is good no matter how good the video is. But it will also act as a great reference point going forward. If I start with one of the earliest matches I've been recommended, it will give me a base of understanding when we discuss future matches in this project. This match also gives me an opportunity to point out two things about Lucha that will be important to keep in mind as we move forward. First of all, a fair amount of Lucha will be contested under two out of three falls conditions, as opposed to the one fall win condition that's kind of just standard in most places in the world. Not every match will be two out of three falls, but I'm just pointing this out so you won't get confused when I start talking about matches in terms of what fall we're in. Secondly, this is a Lucha de Apuesta, literally a bet fight. In Apuestas, wrestlers put up a key aspect of their identity, generally their mask or their hair. Aesthetic is very important in Lucha, so losing one of these matches is devastating. Apuestas tend to be the most beloved matches coming out of Mexico. As such, we're going to be seeing a lot of them as we dive deeper into the scene. A lot of hot feuds will end in Apuestas, from what I understand. All this is going to sound really basic to seasoned Lucha fans, but I'm not 
a seasoned lucha fan and i'm not making this video for <laughs> seasoned lucha fans so i'm sorry if that bit came off as a bit well duh anyway let's just talk about the match <laughs> So the match itself is just fantastic. This will have come at the end of a feud I'm not privy to, but no context is required at all to enjoy. And I know that because I have no context, really. Everything about this match is simple and easily understandable in every way, which is the biggest strength of this match. The heel face dynamics become obvious right away as MS1 jumps Sangra on the way to the ring. This cuts Jakana open immediately. This tactic works really well for MS1. He punches Sangra about before hitting a splash to decisively win the first fall. MS1's domination looks to continue into the second fall, but Jakana hits the mother of all Hail Marys, which allows him to make a comeback punching MS1 to the outside and hitting a tope so gnarly that it would make Sasha Banks blush. This results in a count out equalizing the falls. Sangra is clearly still struggling in the second fall. He's still fighting well, hitting an almighty punch that appeared to cut MS1 open, although there's a chance that happened earlier. The image quality kind of fucked me on that front. But MS1 managed to take control by just pushing him outside and hitting a tope of his own. He's in control for a while, hitting punches, sentons, roll-ups and submissions, seemingly throwing everything in his arsenal at Jakana in an attempt to put him away. Sangra managed to take back control after countering a tope attempt by pushing MS1's head into a row of chairs, but MS1 is able to get back on top, going for a splash which he eats shit on, which almost gets Sangra the two count. But when MS1 pushes Sangra off, he just rolls over and gets a two count on Sangra. It's great. Both guys were so tired that you could absolutely buy that being the finish of the match. MS1 goes for one final sent on, but misses getting stretched out by Sangra for the victory. My recap of this match does it absolutely no justice. But I take solace in the fact that this isn't really a match that can be done justice just by describing what happens. This stands as such a remarkable contrast of the stereotype of Lucha Libre which I described at the start of this video. It's damn near minimalist in regards to what happens. The most major momentum swings throughout the bulk of this match were from punches. Really, really good punches. The dives here don't feel like stunts, they feel like legitimate risks taken to harm an opponent. Not a single second of this match felt staged or controlled. When MS1 ate shit on high risk moves, he really ate shit on those high risk moves. This is of course all helped by the presence of blood from the second the match began. By the end, everything these two did felt like it could have ended the match. I wasn't waiting around for a finisher as my cue to get excited. Again, one of the tensest near falls of the whole match was when MS1 just rolled over onto Sangra after he had failed to get the pin. When I said no context was needed to enjoy this match, I meant it. The hatred these two have towards each other comes through the screen. The very low quality screen. <laughs> like, they hate each other so much that Sangra is attacking MS1 after the bell. Like, Dude, you won. He's going to lose his hair, don't you worry. Just calm down, lad. <laughs> from a structural standpoint, this is fantastic. As you can probably tell from the match recap, they used the three falls of this match to divide it into a three act structure. Villain outpowers our hero. Our hero valiantly fights to survive and finds the means to overcome the villain. It's simple, effective, and performed to perfection here because I can't stress this enough as performers, both men played their roles perfectly. I'll start with MS1. He was such a wonderful heel here. Attacking Sangra from the start and just being so hateable. I felt it when he started taunting while Jakana was on the outside recovering from the beatdown he had given him. Through the first and even parts of the second fall in this match he is calm and collected. He has a plan and it's going well and that kind of just melts away as the match goes on. He stops 
being in control and starts going for higher risk moves. He's losing his kill under pressure and ultimately it cost him. Strang with Chikana worked so well from underneath. There was never a point in this whole match where I believed he was in any way okay. Just moving around you could tell that he was only just holding on. Even the way he got out of the ring after the count out looked groggy to me. It was just a fantastic masterful underdog selling performance coupled with a blade job that would make a lesser match worth seeing. I can't recommend this match enough. I don't do star ratings anymore but this would get top marks. I see no real fault in it. It never dragged. Everything went towards the end goal of the match. It was brutal, it was effective. Even years later with low quality footage, it's one of the most visceral and gritty matches I've ever seen and a great first stop on our journey of learning Lucha. That was cheesy. Oh god, is that really how we're ending with- Thank you so much for checking out this series. It's been a series I've wanted to start since last year, but the 2000 video was kind of in the way. Did you enjoy this? Is there any changes you'd want to see to the format? Is there any episodes you'd want to see? This is essentially a pilot episode, so any changes you want to see made, please let me know. As always, if you want to catch more of me, you can catch me on Twitter at ChrysalisPiero. You can also subscribe here if you want to see more of my videos. And that's pretty much it. Thank you for tuning in. I'll see you next time, guys.